The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. You are standing in the doorway of the diabolic, the dangerous, the deadly. And in a minute or so, you will hear one of the strangest tales we've ever told. A story unlike any we have ever poured into your willing ears. Because this is a story about a man you knew only too well. A man who personified the diabolic, the dangerous, the deadly... To an entire generation, a man the world will never forget or forgive. We're pumping too fast, Doctor. Hey, look at his skin, he's turning purple. Wait another, another minute. We must improve his heart action. You'll kill him this way. He's too old to stand this. Uh, look, look, he's trying uh, to speak. Uh, uh, that, yes. Uh, that, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, my hero. Yes, I know. I know. You are tired. My hero. Our mystery drama, The Rise and Fall of the Fourth Reich, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Robert Dryden and Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is Mexico City, a noisy, bustling city full of people and automobile traffic. Right now, we're standing at the intersection of the Paseo de la Reforma and the Avenida de los Insurgentes. We're watching a black thunderbird make its way down the avenue and then turn into the narrow, crazy quilt streets of the makeshift neighborhood they call the Ciudadas Perdidas, one of the lost cities built by the squatters. There are two men in that automobile. One of them is a man of 71 years, and his name is Dr. Hans Bundeschaff. The other is a man who has many names. So we'll let him introduce himself. You can call me Gunther. When I lived in London, I used the name George Brighton. When I lived in New York, I called myself... <sighs> What's the difference? Now I'm in Mexico. And my name is Gunther Binder. And that's good enough. Gunther, is that the building? Yes, yes, looks like it. Do you have the photograph with you? Yeah, right here in the envelope. Hmm? Uh, yes, 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 that's the building, Doctor, but, but it looks empty, even abandoned. If our information is correct, and if God is with us, there is still one occupant. <laughs> As we mounted the stairs of the ancient building, it was hard to believe that the information was correct or that God was even aware of this dingy hovel on the edge of nowhere. But then we were at the door of the third floor back apartment and it was obvious that no lock was necessary because no thief could be interested in what might lie behind that door. But we were very interested. We had spent a lifetime seeking it. Or rather, seeking him. Gunther. Gunther, look. Dear Lord. He doesn't look alive. Yes, yes, but he's breathing. You can see him breathe. Doctor, how can we be sure? He doesn't look like... There's barely any resemblance. He's 86 years old, Gunther. What did you expect? But... But we are sure it's him? There's no question of verification. It's him. The one we have sought for so long. I must try to speak to him. He's unconscious. He won't hear you. I must try. My Führer. My Führer. 
Can you hear me? My Fiora, we have come to take you home. But our work was just beginning. First, we emptied the trunk of our rented automobile and I brought the heavy black suitcase containing Dr. Bundeshaft's apparatus up the three flights of rickety stairs. Fortunately, the man we had found in the third floor back apartment was the building's only occupant, so our thumping and bumping didn't disturb anyone, not even the man himself, who remained comatose throughout, his breathing growing more labored all the time. We'll have to use the oxygen soon. I think he's suffering from cardiac insufficiency. Are we too late, Doctor? No, no, he's lasted this long. He'll last until we're ready. We'll have to clean up this place, too. It's it's filthy. Our informant said there was an old lady who took care of him. Yeah, I've seen her. She came around while we were bringing the trunks upstairs. She, she asked me about El Ciego. El Ciego? That means the blind one. I, is he blind? Mm. Cataracts. Thick as bottles over both eyes. But don't worry, Gunther. We'll take care of that, too. Our Fuhrer will see again. Our Fuhrer will see the coming glory. Uh, what did you tell the old woman? <laughs> Something that didn't surprise her. I told her, El este muerto. He is dead. El este muerto. Yes, of course, the old lady believed it, and so did the rest of the world. Because our Führer had arranged it that way, in one of the most subtly conceived and well-executed deceptions in history. A plan formulated long before the first excavation of the Führer bunker below the Chancellery. I remember that day in Berlin... When the operative we called Leopard came up with the exciting news. I'm telling you, it's true. I got the information straight from the engineer in charge of the construction. But what happened? How did they find the tunnel? They were making a foundation for a new apartment building in the Hansa Quarter. And the whole thing collapsed. That's how they uncovered it. Six miles long, Gunther. Leading straight from the Chancellery to what must have been a secret airfield. That's just speculation. Hear the rest of it. There's a barn at the site, or what's left of a barn. But there isn't any loft or stables or anything you might expect to find in a barn. You mean it was used as a hangar? Nobody wants to believe it. Not officially. Or they'll claim that Hitler never carried out his escape plan. Mm, but you think otherwise. What I believe is the Fuhrer confided his true intentions only to Bormann and Goebbels. All the others in the bunker were kept in the dark so they could testify to the authorities about his so-called suicide and Viking funeral. Good Lord. But, but the body in the blanket, the body that Heinz Linger burned. It was a corpse that he burned. But not the corpse of Adolf Hitler. I simply can't believe it. You remember Bormann's statement that the face had to be covered because it was disfigured? Yes. Gunther, the face was covered because it was the face of some orderly, not the face of der Führer. And now that face was in front of me, his face. The little square mustache gone, the black hair with its slanted lock across that famous forehead, gone. The lips that had once blared out martial music loud enough to stir the world had vanished into a black, toothless hole. The eyes that had given hypnotic guidance to millions looked out blindly through thick, gray windows. I stared at that face, and I turned to Dr. Bundeschaff. Doctor, doctor, is it really possible? Can we make him smile again? It is possible, Gunther. We can make him smile and feel happiness for the future. But first, we must make him understand. Shall I increase the pressure, Doctor? Yes. yes slowly, slowly. Uh, he doesn't seem to respond to anything. I'm not a physician. I know my opinion doesn't matter. He's not in coma, Gunther. This condition of his is more resignation. He has stopped caring about being alive. His skin color is changing. More pressure, Gunther. The needle is near the danger mark. Now. More pressure, I say. We are pumping too fast, Doctor. 
Look at his skin. He's turning purple. Another minute. We must improve his heart action. You'll kill him this way. He's too old to stand this. <laughs> He's trying to speak. Estoy cansado. What's he saying? Quick, quick, kill the pump. Cansado. Cansado. It's not German. No, Gunther. It isn't German. But don't forget, he's lived outside of Germany for 30 years. What does he say? He says that he is tired. Very tired. He wants us to leave him in peace. My Führer, my Führer, listen to me. Do you think he hears you? No, look, look at his eyes. He's blind. He knows someone is here, Gunther. My Führer. Yes. Yes, my Führer. I know, I know you are tired, but now you can sleep, and when you wake, we will give you the future. It was another 24 hours before Stiller arrived. Stiller was a doctor too, but he was able to do something that Dr. Bundeschaft could never do. He was an ophthalmologist, and he would apply his surgeon's skill to the cataracts that prevented our Führer from seeing the men who had come to restore him to power. I'll do what I can, Hans. But don't expect me to perform miracles. Well, why not, Stiller? We have performed one. We have found him. It's not enough simply to remove the cataracts. He'll need to be fitted with special glasses. Perhaps not. Not after our endocrine treatment. Hans... You still persist in this dream. I know what I have accomplished before. I know what I can accomplish now. But this challenge is too great. A man of his age, in his condition... I will need your assistance, Schiller. Gunther is a fine young man, but he, he lacks professional skill. I'm an eye doctor, Hans. I know nothing about glands and hormones and all your other mysteries. Please, please, Schiller, help me. Help me make it worthwhile for those eyes to see again. All right, Hans. If you can believe in miracles, I suppose I can, too. The operation was performed. From Stiller's point of view, it was a success. The gray clouds covering the old man's eyes were lifted. But it was only after new strength was pumped relentlessly into his bloodstream, after stimulants had excited the action of his heart and liver and pancreas and nervous system, did we see any reaction or result. And then, the moment arrived. The moment when Adolf Hitler opened his eyes and spoke to us. Who are you? Did you hear me? Who are you? What do you want of me? We, we are your subjects. What? Your subjects, my Führer. You are mad. You are all mad. I am no one. Let me alone. Let me die. No, no, my Führer. You will not die. Stop calling me that. My name is Marcos. Please, please, listen to me carefully, my Führer. My name is Hans Bundeschaff. I am a doctor, an endocrinologist. I served your cause for many years. I have performed thousands of experiments on behalf of the Reich. Experiments probing into the very core of life itself. Yeah, please. You must... Stop this. I will not hear more of this talk. These lies. I am nothing but an old man. My Fjord, please uh, hear me out. While you are bringing Germany victories on the battlefield, I was seeking victory in the laboratory. I failed, just as we all did. Failed? Failed? We were betrayed. Yes, yes, betrayed, of course. And out of that betrayal, we were defeated. But out of that defeat may now come victory. Victory? What are you saying? He speaks the truth, my fear. 
Who are you? Uh, I... I am Gunther. Uh, Gunther Binder. Your subject, too. This is madness. I know that I was too young to serve your cause when you first brought glory to our nation, but... But my father served it and died for it. And now I want to be part of the new glory. New glory? What are you raving about? Lunatics! Tell him, doctor, please. No, Gunther. You tell him. All right, all right, I will. My Führer, uh, we have come to restore you to power. <laughs> As you can see, we have found ourselves in the middle of a horror story. A nightmare made all the more terrifying because of the reality that inspired it. But can Dr. Hans Bunderschaft make good on his incredible promise? Can a handful of men, even with the decayed body of a former tyrant, create a fourth Reich in the world? We'll be back shortly with Act Two. things are taking place in a near-abandoned hovel on the edge of Mexico City. The third-floor back apartment has been converted into a clean white box of a room filled with gleaming chrome apparatus and the smell of strong chemicals. But there is something more than medical progress being discussed, for the men who have gathered in this room are discussing surgery on the world. Don't misunderstand, my Führer. We are not men of politics. We know there are others who can guide you better than we. Politics? I know nothing of politics. Why should an old man know anything but the water he drinks, the food he puts into his mouth? But you remember this much, my Führer. You remember that politics is power. Nothing more. Power? <laughs> And is that what you offer me? Are you my army? My legions? Is this my new chancellery? But we speak of a different power now. There is only one power. Strength. And I have none. Yeah, look at me. I am old. Die. But the power we are talking about is strength. Strength... Life, youth. Youth? Now I know you are mad. You would make me young again? Yes. Yes, my Fuhrer. We can give you back the years that were lost in Germany when you so wisely escaped from Berlin. We don't know how many years we can promise you or how much vitality we can restore. But it will suffice for your return to the fatherland. Hans, look at him. His eyes. Madness. All madness. It is enough for now, Hans. Let him rest. You've troubled him enough. We must make him understand. It's no good unless he realizes. No, no, no. Stella is right. He has stopped listening to us. We will speak to him again. Later. It was later, all right. Almost two weeks later, before we heard the voice of Adolf Hitler again. But Bundeschaft was a busy man during that two-week period. I had expected him to begin the restosterone treatments first, but instead he chose to administer massive doses of vitamins. And then he began a series of amphetamine injections whose effects he watched with concern for the stamina of Hitler's heart. But the Führer survived. And then, Bundeschaft began the critical phase. The hormonal injections which he had used to restore temporary youth to gray-haired rodent veterans of the laboratory. Stiller and I watched the procedure in awe and skepticism. A man isn't a rat, Hans. It's simply not the same thing. We have had similar results with primate Stiller. Don't tell me now that a man is not an ape. I still cannot believe in this miracle of yours. But he is stronger. You can see that for yourself. He grows stronger every day. Mm. But will he grow younger? We'll soon know. And then, on the night of the tenth day, 
we were awakened by a horrendous cry. My God! My God, what is it? It's him. The Führer must not be bound by existing legal regulations. The Führer is leader of the nation, supreme commander of the armed forces, head of government, supreme executive chief, Supreme Justice and leader of the party. He's out of his head. Yes, yes, my fear. My fear. Please, yeah. easy, easy. Lie back. Yeah. Lie back and relax. Yeah. yeah. I must conserve my strength. Yes, yes, that's right. You must. My strength is the strength of Germany. Uh, Seems to have gone back to sleep. Yes. Yes. Uh, Yes, he sleeps. And this time, his dreams are brighter. Much brighter, Gunther. Maybe our Führer's dreams were brighter. But Dr. Bundeschaft's dream began to fade as the days wore on. Despite daily massive doses of the hormonal formula there seemed to be little change in the years that lined the face of Adolf Hitler. And Stiller began to question whether the dream would ever be fully realized. Hans, why do you persist? I was never convinced that your primate experiments were valid. Everyone has been skeptical. Most of all myself. But I know it is true, Stiller. You should have conducted other human experiments first. To begin with this There one. could not be a more important beginning. Or ending. Didn't you have many deaths? Even among your apes? Yes, yes, there were errors. A sudden change in the androgen balance can sometimes be dangerous. And if such a change occurs now, what will you have? A dead old man? No. No, this is one thing we must not have. Merely a dead old man. And so the experiment went on day after day. Until finally some improvement began to appear. Blood pressure? Almost in the normal range. Mm. Red blood cell count? Not much improvement yet. Muscle tone? Well, that's hard to say, doctor. His skin seems firmer to the touch, more elastic. You see, Stiller? One improvement after another. Do you still think we will fail? It's a question of time, Hans. Whether you have enough time. Yes, yes, time. Time is the enemy. We're in a race. All right. We will double our efforts by doubling the dosages. But that might kill him. The, the, the shock. We will have to try, Gunther. <laughs> So we doubled the dosages. The risk was great, but Dr. Bundeschaft was encouraged by Hitler's ability to withstand the initial treatment. There was only one problem. The increased dosages seemed to affect his mind, and days of delirium followed. Yeah, fools. All fools. Our enemies are enemies of themselves. What is he saying, Gunther? I can't make it out. Britain. Britain is a dying empire. Dying. America is trying to be its heir. Russia wants the Balkans. Deprive them of the belief that victory is certain. We must show them that they can never reckon on our capitulation. Never. Never. Doctor, don't you think this is dangerous? No, no, no. Let him carry on. Smash the Americans. Forty-five German divisions. His voice grows stronger. Get me, General Kalak. He may be unhinged, Doctor. Then all this would have been for nothing. We must wait and see. There must be no holding back now. No commander must hold back his forces. Disobedience will be punished by death. Kala, Kala, I, I hold you personally responsible. Do you understand? What is he saying? Who are those people? He commands generals who are gone. I say that he's mad. I say this whole experiment is mad. Oh, no, Stiller. The Fuhrer only dreams. He must dream of yesterday before he can dream of tomorrow. The second miracle took place that same day. Here. 
Careful. Yeah, yeah. Lift him carefully. Here. So, Here, Doctor. Now, let me help you, sir. Are you sure it's all right to do this, Hans? Yes. Yes, I think we can. All the life signs are encouraging. His pulse, his color, his blood pressure. Even his eyes seem to be in better focus, Doctor. I think he's beginning to see us. Ah. His lips are moving. Can't he does. Move. He does see us. My Führer. My yeah. Führer. Can you hear me? Ah. Can you understand what I am saying? My Führer. Who are you? I told you my name. It is Bundeshoff. You are... German? Yes. Yes. I am German. And I am a physician. Why are you here? What is your purpose here? My purpose is... Reincarnation, my Führer. There is no such thing. Then I will use the word... Rejuvenation. You can make people young again. It has been my goal for all the years of my life. And where were you, Doctor, during the war? I was assigned by the SS to Dachau to participate in the noble experiments of racial hygiene. But I convinced my superior, Dr. Sigmund Rosha, that I would be better utilized in research, which would uncover the mysteries of the aging process. Uh, I know of no such experiment. It was to be Dr. Rosha's surprise present to you, my Führer, a gift such as no loyal subject had yet given you, the secret of eternal youth itself. And so, what became of this gift? Dr. Rosher abandoned the experiments after our early failures. Like Steinach and Voronov before us, our efforts produced only short-lived improvement in the aged. We were forced to conclude that the testes of men were useful only in the formation of spermatozoa and the secretion of hormone. Yeah, yeah, I understand nothing of this. That even the synthesis of testosterone was of no great consequence, although testosterone was one of the chemicals I still employ in the process. What process? The process I developed in Stockholm where I worked after the war. It is no magic formula, my Führer. It is a synergistic group of chemicals which I believe will eventually lead to an acceptable method of human rejuvenescence. Is it true? Is what you say really true? It is. It is all true, my Führer. You can make me as I was? We can do only so much. But it will be enough for the cause. Enough to make the world tremble at your resurrection from the dead. The world. And when you make your reappearance at the proper time, in the proper place, it will be like a lightning bolt illuminating the planet. That is our hope, my Führer. We wish it to be your hope, too. Hope. But I had Abandoned it. Thirty years ago. But we bring you hope again, my Führer. Hope for a new beginning. The beginning of the next thousand years. Tell us. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us what you wish. Very well. I will tell you what I wish. I wish for something to eat. And with those words, we knew that it was going to work. That our Führer was back among us again. That the day of the Fourth Reich had dawned. The Fourth Reich sends shivers up and down your back, doesn't it? But the idea has created ecstasy in that small room in Mexico City as three men watch eagerly as Adolf Hitler dines. His appetite used to be greater. He could swallow whole countries at one sitting. Now he seems to be content with a bowl of soup. But if he has a new chance at power, well, let's wait and see what happens when I return with Act Three.
still exciting events occurring for doctors Bundershoff and Stiller and the young man who calls himself Gunther. The same excitement parents feel when their child takes his first hesitant step. Because now, Adolf Hitler is taking his. Careful. Carefully now, don't overdo it. My limbs are still so, so weak. Take my arm, my Führer. No, no, no. I can do it alone. I must do it alone. Good, good. Now, uh, only this far, my Führer. Just to the chair. Yes. Yes, I can. I can do it. There. Ah, you did it. I knew you could. And now I want to see a mirror. A mirror? You heard what I said. I wish to look at myself. It's all right, Gunther. There's a mirror advisor in my bag. Let him look into that. Yes, 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 of course. Ah, here it is. Uh, is that me? Yes. Yes, my Fiora. You can see how much you have changed since our arrival. How much firmer your flesh has become. How much improved the color of your skin is. But I am still hairless. Yes, yes. The hormonal treatments cannot restore your hair. If anything, they do the opposite. But there is still something we can do about that. False hair. A wig? Like a woman? For the image, my Führer. Only for the sake of your image. Oh. A wig. A moustache. So that all those who see you will know and remember. Yeah. Yeah. That must be done. For the sake of my people. I must return to my people the way they remember me. Within the week, it was accomplished. Bistiller found the appropriate adornments, a hairpiece that vaguely resembled Hitler's own. The moustache was easier to find. When we looked at the effect, we all shuddered in ecstasy. And when Hitler himself saw the image, it did as much for him as all of Bundeschaft's formulas and vitamins and injections. Uh, but the Führer became impatient. Now, I tell you, I'm ready now. Your miracle has worked. Dr. Bundeschaft, you have done what you claimed you could do. Now I am ready to return to my people, to my country, to the world. There must be no undue haste, my Führer. The timing of your appearance must be right. Tell him, Gunther. It's true, my Führer. The entire movement must be carefully prepared for the putsch that will bring you back to power. Then prepare them. Tell them I am here. I know they have been waiting for me as I waited for them for long, empty years after the war. Have they well, never dreamed that their talk would be led by the beloved Führer himself. But now they must know. They will, my Führer. In time they will. But the world has changed since you went into exile. Fool! Do you think I managed to live to this age of mine? An outcast? A useless derelict? By feeding on the past? No. No, what sustained me was the future. Always the thought of the future. Well, that was wise. For years after my exile, I considered the means whereby the Reich would rise again. I knew the day of great land armies was over and finished. Of armadas and armor and massive bombing. I knew that victory was now determined by a handful of excited atoms. Yes. Yes, you are quite correct, my Führer. That would be my plan of conquest for the Reich. My warriors would be atomic guerrillas. Please, don't excite yourself. Then tell them, Bundeschaft. Tell them I am ready. Yes, my Führer. We will communicate with the Vaterland. And tell them. Dr. Stiller left us that afternoon. 
He had a serious operation to perform on the retina of a close friend. It didn't matter, however, his part in the experiment was over. Mine, though, was still important. I left the small room on a series of errands, shopping for the vegetable staples which constituted the diet of Adolf Hitler, buying pharmaceutical supplies and picking up a large, flat box at a tailor shop whose proprietor seemed mystified by what he had just delivered into my hands. Uh, here it is, Doctor. Yes. Yes, it's perfect. Exactly what we wanted. And now to find out how well it fits. Twenty minutes later, Adolf Hitler was in full uniform. He stepped out in front of us, a willing model, turning to give his audience the full benefit of the effect. His right hand was on his hip. The left, still useless from the bomb damage that had destroyed his nerves, was held rigidly at his side. An iron cross hung from the breast pocket, and there was a black, white, and red armband circling his left arm, the sign of the broken cross. But there was one other thing in the image before us, the most electrifying sight of all. Adolf Hitler was smiling. They call you Günther. Yes, my Führer. I will call you Günther, too. Thank you, my Führer. You will be rewarded, Günther. You and Dr. Bundeschaff and Dr. Stiller. You will all three be at my side in the coming days of victory. You will be privileged to witness the birth of true peace in this world. True peace, Günther. You know what that is? No, my Führer. Not the peace of blind pacifists. Peace not supported on the palm leaf fans of tearful pacifist mourning women, but founded on the victorious sword of a lordly people that puts the world to work for a higher culture. Do you understand, Gunda? Yes, yes, of course. Why are you sweating? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing, sir. I, I, I am just overwhelmed. My Fuhrer, please, please, you must not excite yourself. Steiner must counterattack the Russians. The Luftwaffe ground troops must be alert. Please, you must sit again. You stood too long. Ah. Ah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I must sit down. And you, Gunther, you must come here. Go ahead, Gunther. Gunther, kneel down. Yes, my Führer. I am kneeling. Gunther, you must take this. No, no, my Führer, no, not the Iron Cross. It is yours. No, no, no. I wish you to have it. I wish you to have it from your Führer's own hand. For bravery in battle. For exemplifying the ideals of Aryan manhood. Here, Günther, my son. I give you... Uh, wait. What is that? What, my Führer? This... This chain around your neck. Only a chain, my Führer? But this... This ornament hanging from it. It's not an ornament, my Führer. It is a symbol. It is called the Star of David. What? The Star of David? The Jewish Star of David? It was given to me by my father. No, no not, not from his hand directly. He was, he was dead when I received it. Wunderschaft! Wunderschaft! Do you hear this? You are harboring a traitor! A traitor! The truth is, I took it from his body. I was only five years old at the time, but I had the sense to take it from him before it was taken by the guards at Auschwitz. Wunderschaft! Do you hear? Kill him! Kill him! 
You are betrayed! It's taken me 36 years to get here, my Fuhrer. 36 years after my holiday in Auschwitz. 34 years after Dr. Russia froze my mother and father to death before my eyes. My naked mother and father lying on the ground while the guards poured water over their bodies and grumbled that they had to crack the ice before the water would pour. Brother Quickly! He, he means to hurt me! Yes, I hear the sound of the cracking ice always in my ears and the sound of that water splashing and the sound of my mother's voice begging for a quicker death, begging for something that you won't be denied! Good Lord. Adolf! Good Lord, stop, that's enough. No, Doctor, not enough! Wunderschaft! He has a knife! A scalpel, Adolf, a scalpel for the final incision! Ah! My God! Wunderschaft, help me! He... He has cut my wrist wide open. I am bleeding. Gunther, Gunther, why? Why did you do this? Save me, Doctor. We have been betrayed once again. Betrayed by... Oh, Gunther, Gunther. Why couldn't you have waited? Why couldn't you let us bring him home and share your vengeance? What are you saying? Bundeschaf. Not you, too. You are not part of this betrayal. No. No, my fear. Not part of a betrayal. Nearly part of a revenge. But I thought you were a good German. A loyal German. Yes. Yes, I was that, my Führer, until I was brought to your service at Dachau and learned what loyalty meant to those who served depraved animals. I, you, you, the bleeding. Hey, stop, please, the bleeding. No, no, Doctor, I, let it happen here and now. Uh, but why? Why did you do this? Why did you give me back my strength, my hope? I was a dying old man. Why did you make me into... into this? Only to murder me? You don't know. You don't understand, my Führer. No. Why? Why? Tell him, Gunther. Who cared about destroying a dying old man? What good was our vengeance unless you had strength? and hope. Now, do you understand, my Führer? And so, Adolf Hitler dies, not in the bunker beneath the chancellery in Berlin, but in a dingy, deserted rooming house in Mexico City. There will be no Viking funeral for him this time. No obituaries, no mourners, just a memory, a very bad memory, but one which no man can ever afford to forget. I'll be back shortly. You know, some people might find it hard to believe the story you've just heard either because they can't accept the idea that Hitler might still be alive, or they can't accept the idea of rejuvenation. Well, I can't prove the first part, but I think I can support the second, because I know a prime example of rejuvenation. It's called radio drama. We hope you agree. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, Joe Silver, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'm a very busy man. I and guess. prefer to spend as little time as possible in the company of anyone as vicious and depraved as Guy Richards. Yes, I know. But that's exactly why I asked you to come and see me. Warden, before very long, you're going to be spending all your time in my company. Ha <laughs> ha. I don't blame you for looking puzzled. Let me explain. Yes, do explain. 
A little more than a year ago, Warden, I was a professor of parapsychology at the university. I was happily married, successful, and deeply involved in my work. And then suddenly, shockingly, for no apparent reason, I became... Well, the embodiment, you might say, of a man who has been dead for many, many years. Jack the Ripper. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>